My name is Kishore Mahanti. I would like to say a few words about the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. Uh, there are about 25 professors who work in this center. We do all kinds of research, uh, starting from oil and gas, all the way to carbon capture and geothermal. We have uh, about 10 industrial affiliates programs, which the industry calls JIPs. You can see the list over here. Uh, the first one is like hydraulic fracturing, the last one is like carbon utilization, storage, and transportation. Um, <clears throat> we like to do a, a webinar every month by our faculty members. Uh, this is a way of uh, technology transfer for us. And um, we do that on the second Tuesday of each month uh, at noon at this time. So I hope you attend some of these. And if you cannot attend, we put these webinars on the YouTube channels of our uh, center, so you can also get to it there. So uh, we have a seminar next month. Uh, it will be May 10th. That's by Professor Larry Lake. He will be talking about uh, going from CO2 EOR to CCUS. In fact, uh, here is the flyer for that. So I hope you can attend that next month. But today's speaker is uh, Professor Matthew Bala. He's in fact the director of our center. He got his PhD in uh, 2005 and joined UT uh, in 2007, has been here 15 years, uh, worked through the ranks. He's now a full professor. He's actually called the Bank of America professor. And uh, he has published 85 uh, peer-reviewed technical papers in journals and back a lot of um, awards from SPE. Um, so uh, he's going to be speaking today on polymer flooding. So uh, if you have any questions during his talk, uh, please write down your question in the Q&A section and um, Matt is going to answer those at the end of his talk. So with that, um, Matt Baloff. Okay, um, well, thank you so much, Kishore, for the introduction. Um, today, I'm going to talk about new insights and mechanisms for chemical enhanced oil recovery using polymers. Most of this work was conducted as part of the uh, chemical EOR industrial affiliate program. Uh, we have our annual review meeting later this month for our sponsors. If you're interested in learning more about it, at the end of the webinar, we'll provide a link for a very short video describing some of the work that we do there. So uh, in chemical enhanced oil recovery, uh, there's at least two different ways to, to do this or, or a combination. One is to use surfactants, of course, and so for surfactants are designed to reduce the interfacial tension and alter the wettability. And in that way, it produces residual or capillary trapped oil. The other popular method is to use polymers. So polymers are, of course, uh, viscous macromolecules in an aqueous solution. And because of their high viscosity and favorable mobility, they give us mobility control. So the idea is, is that instead of having uh, fingering and poor mobility control, we can get better sweep efficiency. So in this way, we produce uh, bypassed or unswept oil. However, the conventional wisdom is that polymers do nothing for residual oil saturation. Again, that's what surfactants are for, and we often use those in, in combination as well as with alkali. What I hope to show you today is, is that polymers, if they have special tailored rheology, they can reduce the residual oil saturation. So in addition to unswept oil, we can produce residual oil. And some of this came, uh, this motivation came from a plot that uh, my colleague Gary Pope showed me uh, years ago when I first started at UT and this is a, uh, some work that a master student did uh, quite some time ago and showed that in two similar cores uh, 
the polymer flood appeared to produce a lower residual oil saturation than the than the water flood. And, and again, that's really exciting because it, it sort of goes against what uh, we have done for uh, assumed for decades. Um, so, you know, the question, of course, is, is the polymer FUD really reducing the residual oil saturation? It's possible that because of the mobility ratio that water flood would eventually get to that SOR, but it would take many, many, many poor volumes. It's also possible that we had, uh, even though the cores are similar, that they were different enough to where uh, we get that. But it was still an exciting result nonetheless, and there have been other researchers that have shown in the field and the laboratory that uh, there could be something here. That if the polymer had special rheology, that is, it's viscoelastic, then it might reduce the residual oil saturation. So a little bit of background about rheology. Uh, or, or, uh, first, let me talk about a capillary desaturation curve. So this is the residual non-wetting or oil saturation versus capillary number. And what we see is the residual oil saturation is, uh, is basically constant for low capillary numbers. And then if you get above the knee of the capillary of the capillary desaturation curve, this critical point, then the residual oil saturation decreases tremendously. Now, a typical water flood is somewhere over here, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5. Um, so reducing the interfacial tension by orders of magnitude can get us over here, right? So that's, that's why we use surfactants to reduce residual oil. But a polymer increasing the viscosity, and we can see that the capillary number is proportional to the viscosity, might only increase this by an order of magnitude and, and should have no real effect on SOR. So again, that's why we, we've believed for decades that, that polymers do nothing for residual oil saturation, even though they produce unswept oil. So uh, about the rheology, EOR polymers are almost always shear thinning and they may be viscoelastic. So here's a typical plot of viscosity versus shear rate. And the red curve is in our rheometer. Uh, this, uh, this text box is covering up, but usually you have a Newtonian plateau. And then at higher shear rates, the viscosity decreases. That's what we get in the rheometer in bulk. In some core samples, um, in, in some core flooding um, that we do, we'll see some shear thickening occur at high shear rates. So it deviates from what we get in the rheometer. And that's usually attributed to viscoelasticity. Now, again, some polymers like hydroxypolyacrylamide are viscoelastic, especially at high molecular weights and low salinities. Other polymers, many biopolymers like xanthan and glucan, uh, tend to not be viscoelastic, and we don't see shear thickening behavior. Uh, more about the elasticity. So a viscoelastic fl a fluid is has got properties of both a viscous fluid and an elastic solid. And we generally characterize or measure that um, by using a G prime, G double prime oscillatory shear plot, which is plotted against the, um, the, the frequency. So uh, this crossover point, which looks to be right around two here, is the inverse of that is the relaxation time. So in this case, we'd say the relaxation time is about 0.5 seconds. A little bit more, you know, the way I like to think of a relaxation time is that a rubber band would have a relaxation time of infinity, okay, or, or close to infinity, very, very high, right? Because if you stretch that, then you would have to stretch it for a very long time before it forgets its original shape. If you were to let it go, it would remember its original shape. So it's got a very high relaxation time. Uh, a viscous liquid like water would have a very short relaxation time because it would forget its original shape almost immediately. If you were to pour it out of a cup, it would it would, it would you know, develop a new shape and wouldn't remember the, the cup that it came from. So that's the relaxation time. And we talk a lot about a dimensionless Debra number, which is a ratio of the relaxation to the residence time. So the Debra number is proportional to the relaxation time as well as the velocity. So in a lot of the work that I'm going to show today, I will uh, talk in terms of the dimensionless Debra number. 
and show that as we increase the Deborah number, we can reduce the residual oil saturation more. Uh, in the laboratory, it's fairly easy to increase the velocity, which will increase the Deborah number. So sometimes I'll do that. In the field, we don't have as much control over the velocity, but the relaxation time is a polymer property. And, and we could tailor the structure and, and we can create new polymers that have um, a higher relaxation time. It's a function of molecular weight, salinity, uh, temperature to, to some extent, as well as uh, a few other properties, concentration. So the objective of this work um, generally, and this has been something I've been working on for over a decade now, is to determine the effect of polymer elasticity on our residual oil saturation. So we're going to carefully design some core flood experiments to isolate the effect of viscoelasticity and to see if there's really something there. We're going to develop a new models relating to residual oil saturation and Deborah number. So these are going to be macroscopic models that could be used for prediction, including in, into some simulators. Uh, the new model we're, we're going to create is going to be called an elastic desaturation curve. Then we're going to do some microfluidics and some poor scale lattice Boltzmann modeling to determine the mechanisms for recovery and develop new theories for residual trapping and mobilization. And then once we do that, we're going to go back to the field scale and we're going to implement our new models and our new understanding and, uh, and try to make predictions and to see what kind of effect this could have at the field scale. So let's start with our core scale observations and upscaling. So just a, um, just a small note, uh, when I started this project, I was mostly a computational person. I'd done a lot of poor scale modeling, including non-Newtonian flow. And that's how I had planned to tackle this problem. Turns out that viscoelastic fluids are so complicated numerically, and there's a lot of difficulty there that uh, that wasn't the best way to start, although I'll show later that I returned to some poor scale modeling. Uh, but one of the reasons I love to give this talk is because it turned me into an experimentalist. So I'm going to show a lot of experiments here, core flood and microfluidics. And, uh, you know, I'm a big believer that we um, we should use whatever tools we can to to try to solve a problem. So a little bit about our core flood apparatus, uh, we have a uh, either an argon cylinder for constant pressure or a syringe pump for constant velocity. We've been, done both. Our chemical column, which will include our polymer. Uh, of course, our vertical core flood, which is uh, one foot in length, two inches in diameter, and we'll have uh, differential pressure transducers all along the core so we can determine that and, and, uh, and a pressure difference across the whole core. And so from that, uh, we can determine things like permeability and relative permeability. Um, and then, but the most important thing is we're going to collect uh, fluid at the affluent, so we'll know how much oil that we're collecting with time. So the experimental design uh, usually went as follows. So we would uh, saturate the core with brine, right? So to mimic what happens in the reservoir. Um, after that, we would inject oil. Uh, some of the early experiments were very heavy oil. Later on, they were much lighter oil, five centipoise. And at the end of that, we, we would have an initial oil saturation of something on the order of 85%. Okay, of course, that, that varied from core to core, but, but that was somewhat typical. Then we would do a water flood. Okay, so we would um, inject brine with a predetermined salinity, uh, about one centipoise. Uh, the majority of these experiments were done in ambient temperature and pressure. And at the end of that, we recovered a lot of oil. Uh, it's difficult to say for sure if this was, we were at residual oil saturation. These were one dimensional experiments. We did many poor volumes and they're relatively homogenous, most of the cores. But there could certainly be some unswept oil. And we wanted to be certain that any oil we produced was due to viscoelasticity and not just due to improved sweep, which is the usual reason for doing polymers. So because of that, we injected a different water-based fluid, glycerin, viscosity of 75 centipoise, and we usually produced a few extra percentage uh, saturation of, of oil, right? So, so we, that would be unswept oil, okay? And because we got this higher mobility ratio, uh, 
with this water-based glycerin, we get that. Now, of course, in the field, we would never inject glycerin, but um, in the laboratory, it was a way of making sure that at this point, we're at residual oil saturation. And if we went through what we had expected for decades, injecting polymer of the same viscosity wouldn't do any good. So we did inject a viscoelastic polymer. Uh, these were usually hydroxypolyacrylamide, usually a molecular weight of about 18 million Daltons. Uh, at the apparent shear rate in the core, uh, it was about 75 centipoise, so no more viscous than glycerol. Nonetheless, many of our experiments, most of our experiments, we produced additional oil. And so I'll show you some additional details about that. So uh, here's an example of one core flood experiment. You can see that this work was published in 2017 in SBEJ. This is the water flood, okay? And this is where we kind of reached an asymptote. No more oil came out, so the oil cut was zero. We weren't sure if we were at residual oil saturation, so we injected that glycerin, which was a Newtonian fluid. It was not viscoelastic, so it had a Debra number of zero. And we did get a couple of extra percent of oil out, but at that point, we really did believe we're at residual oil saturation. Um, and, and you can do fractional throw, flow theory and, and, and show that. But when we injected our polymer flood with a Debra number of about 15, we produced an additional 5% oil. And this is fairly typical. And in fact, I would say normally we even got more, uh, more oil. So uh, on average, I would say it's more like 8, 9, 10%, which is extremely significant. And again, not what we would expect based on fractional flow theory and, and the mobility ratio. To, to further see if we understood this, we did uh, an experiment in our medical CT scanner, our, our computer tomography scanner uh, down in our basement. And um, the way that this works is that you've got a vertical positioning system and you've got your X-ray beam and you put your vertical core in there and then uh, as you lower the core, then, then it, it, it does these scans and you can look at slices uh, of the core. So again, you know, this is a medical CT scanner, so it works exactly the same way. Here's a picture of the actual CT scanner we have in our building. Um, you can see here's the core, here's a vertical positioning system, and that core can be lowered. So when we did that, we did um, about one centimeter each. So there were 30 slices. I'm just showing five equally spaced slices. Uh, the two at the edges, um, you know, those were at the very edges. And so um, although we don't believe we had any capillary end effects, you'll always have some sort of end effect. So I, I'm not um, I'm not going to talk about the two edges, but but towards the middle, what we see is that this is the oil saturation after our glycerol flood. Then, after the glycerol flood, we did the polymer flood, and what we see in these three individual slices is sort of a uniform decrease in oil saturation. So we, we truly believe what we have here is residual oil that was produced, not unswept oil. Okay, and we've, we, we, you know, that was expected from common sense, from some fractional flow theory, and now proven through our CT experiments. So, we're definitely showing that there's something here. Uh, we've done dozens of these experiments. We've done them in Bentheimer cores, Berea cores, Bo Boise uh, rock core types, then high and low viscosity oils. Uh, we vary the Demer number. If, if it was a Newtonian fluid or the Demer number was close to zero, we would usually produce almost nothing. And, um, but if the, the Demer number increased with that we got uh, additional oil. Here's an experiment where we have oil saturation versus pore volumes injected. We didn't inject glycerol this time because the mobility ratio was already favorable because the viscosity of the oil was so light. And we had a high Debra number and we got 11% additional oil, which is really fantastic. And so you can see the final oil saturation is something like uh, 25%. So yeah, it was again, we've done dozens of these experiments. Uh, we've probably done more experiments than what I have shown here, but here is a plot of the residual oil saturation after polymer to um, after, the, after the glycerol flood, or if there was no glycerol flood, the water flood versus the Debra number. And if we had a very low Debra number, then nothing would happen. But as we increase the Debra number, 
uh, the residual oil saturation would decrease. Uh, there's a lot of scatter in, in these, which is expected. These are, these are, these are core floods and, and rocks are complicated, but there's definitely a trend here. And, and um, it, it's got this flat and then it decreases with the log of Deborah, Deborah number as we see over here and, and we fit uh, a model to it. Uh, now, this curve looks a heck of a lot like a capillary desaturation curve, um, which had SOR versus capillary number on a, on a linear log scale. Um, because of that, we call this an elastic desaturation curve, or EDC. I will use this curve and this empirical equation in some simulations that we'll do later on. So, uh, what I show here is another experiment. This is oil saturation versus pore volumes injected. We have our brine flood or water flood, and then we do our glycerol flood. We do produce some more oil there. Uh, I believe that this was in a benthymer. And um, then we did our polymer flood. And I want to be careful here. I call this a low salinity polymer flood, and many of you might be familiar with a low salinity effect. Uh, that's observed in reservoirs, but the salinity was no different than the water flood and the glycerol. So even though the salinity is relatively low, it wasn't any different. And uh, the reason why I used a low salinity is because the lower salinity, the higher the relaxation time and Deborah number. And you can see here we had a very high Deborah number of 300 in this case. We produce an absolutely fantastic 14% recovery. Uh, a little bit of story about this experiment. This was done by a brand new student, um, Mehmet Orensik. This is his first experiment. We were excited about the results, but we, you know, especially since it was a new student, we wanted to verify the, the mass balance. And you know, 14% seemed like a lot. Uh, we wanted to do an additional tracer test, changing the salinity, and um, to see if uh, you know, to, to get a double check for what the mass balance is, right? So that's one way to do that. So we asked the student to do that, and, and he comes back and says, well, you know, I did this experiment, and I got an additional 15% oil out, the final oil saturation 7%. So he told um, Gary Pope and I this, and, and um, be honest, we didn't really believe him. <laughs> thought there was some more sort of mistake there. So we asked him to redo it, and he got very similar results. Um, then we asked our, our more experienced PhD student, Pong Pong, to do the experiments in a different lab with different equipment and, and to, to follow the procedure. And he got, again, very similar results. All in all, we've, we've seen this probably a dozen times. So the summary is that chasing the viscoelastic polymer with an inelastic flood reduces residual oil saturation even more. And I would describe this as perhaps our most impactful and shocking discovery. Uh, I think in one experiment, we got as low as 4%, which is, which is unheard of for polymer floods, right? That, that's the kind of saturation we get for a surfactant flood, which reduces residual oil, but, but never for, for polymer floods. So uh, really exciting, very repeatable. We've had multiple students do this in different labs, and um, it's really an interesting result. So, uh, you know, now that we've seen this in our core floods, we want to under, a better understand why. Because if we understand why what's happening here, then we can optimize it, right? We can tailor our rheology and tailor our, our field uh, procedure in such a way that optimizes this and reduces SOR as much as possible. So we wanted to do some poor scale observations and mechanisms, and this included some microfluidics. Some micromodels, which are, are microfluidic porous media, and some lattice Boltzmann numerical simulations. So I won't go through all the detail uh, about how we do this, but we have a very sophisticated microfluidic and micromodel uh, laboratory um, here at UT Austin in, in the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. Uh, our fabrication technique, we usually use glass. Uh, we find that, that um, to be you know, the, the best way to do our experiments, and we use hydrofluoric etching to do that. We can create any geometry we want using AutoCAD, and, uh, and then we can do experiments cheaply and efficiently and, and visualize what's happening. So uh, I want to start out with some microfluidic experiments in a single channel. So this was some work that uh, a PhD student, um, Zhu Ke, 
did for me um, quite some time ago. And what he showed in these, these channels here was is that if you had a Newtonian fluid flowing in, a, in an oil droplet, that oil droplet would decrease in size, it would go through the poor throat, uh, proportional to the capillary number of flow rate. And he was able to drive a relationship that says the size of that droplet should be proportional to the capillary number to the minus one third. And experimentally, we saw exactly that. It didn't matter if it was brine or glycerin or another Newtonian fluid, we would get this nice capillary number to the minus one third relationship. And so this is published in, in Langmuir in 2015. So what I talked to my graduate students about is I said, well, you know, I bet, I bet something different will happen if we use a viscoelastic polymer. Um, turns out if you use a shear thinning polymer, then nothing different happens. But I said, for a viscoelastic polymer, I bet that we'll get more oil out uh, at the same capillary number. Or it won't quite follow that minus one third, it'll be even better. So on the left is the Newtonian glycerin. On the right is our viscoelastic polymer HPAM at different flow rates or increasing capillary number. And what we saw was extremely interesting. Um, so let's see if I can. Um, so I'm going to play the videos here. What we saw is, is that it would reach a droplet size and then begin to vibrate or oscillate. And we only saw this if the polymer was viscoelastic. Not if it was Newtonian, not if it was shear thinning, like a biopolymer, but if it was viscoelastic, we got this every time. And this was really interesting. It was the opposite of what we had hypothesized because we thought that, that more oil would go through and what actually happens is it gets trapped here. And, and in some ways that, uh, that goes against what we observed in our core flood experiments, although I have some theories as to why this is actually benefits us. Uh, so uh, a postdoc TUZ um, did some modeling um, here and, some, and did some experiments. So this is a droplet size versus capillary number to the minus one third. You can see if it's elastic, then it, then it reaches this asymptote when it starts vibrating. Uh, the amplitude and the frequency is very regular. Um, so that's what we see over here and it depends on uh, the Deber number. And so this is am amplitude versus flow rate. Of course, Deber number is proportional flow rate. And we see some um, interesting relationships here. And he derived an expression as a function not just of the capillary number of the minus one third, but also Deber number. And also the amplitude of these oscillations is related to the Deber number. And so uh, we did some interesting work in there when we published that very recently in physical review letters. Chiyu also did some uh, very exciting lattice Boltzmann simulations. So we had a, a sophisticated lattice Boltzmann code where we could do this. Here's an oil droplet displaced by a Newtonian fluid. And in this other one, it's being displaced by a viscoelastic fluid. And at least qualitatively, we, uh, we get very similar results, right? So in this case, the oil droplet uh, eventually goes through. In this case, um, it, it sort of vibrates. And, uh, and here's a plot of distance from the center versus time. And for that viscoelastic fluid, we get this, this vibration occurring. Um, this is uh, published in physical review letters. She did some other numerical simulations. Um, this is sort of a grain that's got trapped oil. And if you have a Newtonian fluid, you get this new symmetric streamlines, but with a viscoelastic fluid, you get asymmetry. This is often referred to viscoelastic turbulence. Because of that viscoelastic turbulence is able to pull oil droplets out of a trapped region. And um, he also looked at some of the vorticity fields and we see something very different for the viscoelastic. So um, this could be another explanation as to why we're observing what we are in our core floods. Um, so here's another geometry. So this is kind of an oil in a, in a dead end pore. For the Newtonian fluid, you get these nice symmetric streamlines and, and not much happens. But um, if you 
I'll come back. If you look at this, um, if the Debra number is very high, it sort of pulls it out of that dead end four. And then there's one more simulation they did, which I find really interesting. So this is a poor doublet model, which you may be familiar with and is one of the theories for how oil gets trapped. And in this case, if it's an inelastic fluid, could be an inelastic polymer or brine or, or glycerol, what, whatever, the oil gets produced at the top, but then gets trapped at the bottom. If we do a viscoelastic fluid, what happens is that the bottom oil droplet gets produced and not the top one. Now, that's not necessarily better or worse, but it, it could certainly explain why we produce additional oil or different oil than we would from that. Um, but then we did one last numerical simulation. We said, well, let's say after a viscoelastic injection, where, where here's our initial condition, we, we do this simulation with when we chase it with an inelastic fluid again, then it produces that last bit of oil. This could certainly explain our observations that we saw when we did a viscoelastic polymer flood, got more oil, but then we did an inelastic polymer flood afterwards, and we we got even a, even more oil, right? We got all the way down to seven percent um, in this case. So th this poor doublet simulation could be an explanation for that. A little bit more about our. Uh, microfluidic experiments. We do a lot of micro models, which are sort of porous media on a chip. And we've uh, developed in, in our laboratory what we call a core flood on a chip. So, uh, you know, micro models are great for visualization. One of the limitations is they tend to be small, like maybe a square centimeter, two dimensional. Sometimes they've got regular geometry and then the, the surface chemistry doesn't necessarily mimic what we have in rock. So what we did is we sought out to create a micro model that better mimicked real rock cores, right? And so some of the things that we wanted is to have three dimensional features so that it captured snap off and residual oil and also provided continuity of the grain phase, heterogeneous pore structure, uh, tailorable surface chemistry. And then finally, and this is a big one, length scales on the order of feet, right? Because our core floods are like a foot long. A micro model is millimeters or, or maybe a centimeter at biggest usually. And you have a lot of end effects. You can't see things like um, oil banks develop and stuff like that. So we did that. My, my graduate students came up with some really neat ways of doing this. So we have a, a novel way of, of including three dimensional features. We call it two and a half D micro models. Uh, heterogeneity was um, included by using statistical algorithms. We've coded our, our micro models at times with calcite. And then finally, we created this uh, long serpentine geometry that's um, anywhere from a foot to a foot and a half total in length. Um, and, and so we can do some really neat things there. And so uh, if you zoom into this core flood on a chip, um, you can see that this is the from AutoCAD. We've got our heterogeneities. And then if you um, look at the actual chip, you've got our grains and our throats and, and pores uh, inside there. So it's this heterogeneous foot long pseudo three-dimensional uh, micro model, so we call it a core flood on a chip. You can do some uh, really neat things with this. We can do everything basically we can do with the core flood. Um, things like measure the permeability. So here's the pressure drop versus flow rate, and of course it's linear. Uh, we can do uh, tracer tests and determine the porosity or pore volume. So on the top is um, from the micro model and the bottom is from a Bourdieu core, so qualitatively you get very similar type things. Um, and of course, we can do some, you know, oil recovery experiments. So uh, this isn't a polymer flood, it's a surfactant flood, but I think it's a good illustration of what we're doing. So if you look here, so this is a foot long micro model. Uh, and the first case on the left, I think we're going to inject brine. And you get some re oil recovery, right, quite a bit, but you get a lot of bypassed oil, some residual oil um, that occurs in that case. On the right, we're going to inject surfactant, which is, of course, going to lower the interfacial tension. 
and it does an excellent job of, of producing that oil. And so you can visualize that. This is something that's very diffi difficult to visualize in a core flow. And here's a snapshot of the experiment. And what's really neat is that we can actually visualize that oil bank and see how that oil bank moves with time. That's something that, uh, you know, again, is very difficult or impossible to see from core flood. So we think we can do really neat things with this core flood on a chip. I see them as uh, sort of screening tools for enhanced oil recovery, right? Because these experiments can do be, be done very fast. They can be done very cheaply in, you know, a bunch of them could be done in parallel. And then the ones that look promising, then we move on to the core floods, which tend to be time consuming and expensive and, and, and a little bit harder to do. So, so let me talk about for, uh, polymer flooding and this core flood on a chip. So uh, recently graduated student using Do um, did some work here where she did this polymer flooding and this core flood on a chip. And what she shows is this oil saturation versus poor volumes injected very similar to the plots we showed for the core floods earlier. So the oil saturation decreases with the water flood. In this case, doing an inelastic polymer flood um, and another glycerol flood had, had no impact, right? Because there was no, there was no uh, viscoelasticity, right? So it didn't reduce the residual oil saturation at all in this case. What she observed um, when she injected elastic polymer was very interesting. This is the oil saturation. It, it sort of reaches its asymptote for several pore volumes. Then we inject the elastic polymer flood and the oil saturation actually increased. And so what I'm guessing is you're thinking is, is how, how on earth did the oil saturation increase because we didn't inject more oil, right? And, and then not only that, that seems like a bad thing. We wanted to decrease. Well, remember that oil saturation is a volume percentage, not a mass percentage and that we're measuring the oil saturation through image analysis, not from affluent mass balance. So what we're able to observe, and I'll show this in just a moment, is there's an emulsion forming. So, so water and oil, water goes into the oil and expands the volume of the oil, so that's why the apparent oil saturation is higher. That doesn't mean that the um, mass of oil is higher, but, but the, the volume percentage is. And then if we follow that up with an inelastic fluid, then it sort of gets rid of that emulsion and produces additional oil. So our final saturation is less than what it was after the water flood. Here are some uh, pictures, right? So we can visualize what's happening by zooming into the, to the micro model. And this is after, say, a glycerol flood. This is an elastic polymer flood. And if you look closely, you can see places where you can see the same amount of oil is expanding and taking up more volume, right? So that's these emulsions that I was talking about. And then finally, if you follow that up with an inelastic viscous flood, then it decreases those emulsions and actually mobilizes the oil and produces more of it, okay? So um, again, you know, this could explain some of our observations from our core floods. So now that we have a, a fairly good um, understanding of what's happening at the pore scale, or I should at least say uh, we've seen enough interesting things to develop some new hypotheses, uh, we wanted to see what would happen at the reservoir scale, right? Because none of this matters if it's just a laboratory effect. If, if, it, doesn't, if it doesn't produce more oil in the field, then, then, then it's purely academic. So what we did is we did some reservoir scale modeling and we used UT Chem, which um, uh, really is the, the world's leading chemical flooding simulator. And we did a five spot. And, and I'm gonna be upfront here and say that we intentionally chose properties that we felt were realistic, but were uh, sort of ideal, right? So, so they were the, you know, we start out with the best case scenario, but then I'll do some sensitivity analysis later. So here's our five spot. We have an injector and producer. Uh, the, the size is 200 feet um, in, in both directions. The bottom hole pressure is 100 PSI. We initially inject brine at 1,000 barrels per day for half a pore volume. And then after that, we inject our, our polymer with a bottom hole pressure of 4,200 PSI. 
The average permeability is five Darcy's, which is uh, not uncommon for the types of reservoirs we do polymer floods. And the initial pressure is 3000 PSI and an oil saturation of 80%. We included uh, heterogeneity with a Dijkstra Parsons coefficient. Oil viscosity was 40 centipoise. Uh, we used a very low brine salinity in, in this case, and, and it was the same salinity for both the brine flood and the uh, polymer flood and um, a polymer concentration of 0.4. The residual oil saturation was 0.3. So again, using a water flood or, or old understanding of polymer floods, we would never expect to get less than 30% oil, even if we did an infinite number of pore volumes of water and polymer. We'll see if we can do better than that. To model this, we've included the elastic desaturation curve, and this is in our most recent versions of UTChem. Um, and what we did say is that we did show significant reduction in residual oil. So this is a plot of the Debra number. And remember, a Debra number of anything greater than about one or 10, we really started to see significant reduction in oil saturation in that elastic desaturation curve. Near the wells where the velocity is highest, the Debra number is the highest, right? So we're looking at Debra numbers of a thousand or greater near the wells, but even far from the wells, we're looking at Debra numbers on the order of, of 100 or at least 10. And, um, and, and so we expect that to reduce residual oil, and in fact, we did. So here's an injector and producer again. This is the residual oil saturation. Near the wells, we're getting to as low as 12 or 15 percent, even far from the wells where the velocity is lower and the Debra number is lower, uh, we're at about 20 percent or so. And remember, the theoretical limit was 30 percent, right? That was if we did an infinite number of poor volumes of water or inelastic polymer. So uh, that's um, really exciting and a demonstration that uh, this is this is plausible. This is something that, that we could see. And we look at the uh, numerical results. This is oil recovery versus pore volumes injected. The blue curve is the water flood. And, um, you know, it, it's going to continue to go on. We would have to inject an infinite number of pore volumes of water before we would get to uh, residual oil saturation. So um, that's the reason why we do polymer floods. So the yellow curve is an inelastic polymer flood, and it does what polymer is supposed to do. It improves the sweep efficiency. It gives us our oil out faster, and you know significantly more oil, the same number of pore volumes injected. But then we injected the elastic polymer, which had the same viscosity, right? Same viscosity, same everything, but, but now we included elasticity and the effect of elasticity, and what we got is about, um, 12% uh, additional oil recovery um, from those, right? And, and that's not doing anything special. Um, it, it's still just doing a polymer flood. It just might be trying to tailor the rheology so that it's got a high relaxation time, high Debra number. Uh, we did do some sensitivity analysis, right? Because as I mentioned before, we did produce some conditions that were very favorable to our, our elastic polymer flood. Um, in a favorable case, at a base case of about 12.3%. However, we, um, we also see that um, even as we vary that, lower concentrations and higher salinities and, and um, lower relaxation times and, and whatnot, we still got a significant amount of oil, right? Um, and even these small numbers like 3% is pretty significant when you consider that um, we're not doing anything differently, right? These numbers are over an inelastic polymer flood. So it's a polymer flood either way. This is just additional recovery. So that's a sort of an additional bonus, I guess, you get from your polymer flood. So uh, with that, I'd like to finish with some final thoughts. Um, so the final thoughts are that viscoelastic polymer is what we've shown over and over again through our core floods is that they do reduce residual oil saturation beyond the water flood or per purely viscous fluid, all right, or even a shear thinning fluid. Um, and we've seen that in many water wet cores and even in some oil wet cores um, is a little less um, convincing, but we definitely saw something there.
and again, this goes against decades of understanding of how polymers work. Um, now, other researchers have seen some similar things. And, um, and, and so I think that there's a growing consensus that um, elasticity has, a, has an effect. New models of polymer relaxation time and this elastic desaturation curve were developed and implemented into UT Chem. And then chasing the viscoelastic polymer with another polymer fluid that had a low elasticity and maybe a higher salinity resulted in an additional and significant reduction in SOR. And again, that, that might have been the most exciting and impactful thing that we saw. Um, there have been other researchers that have shown an elastic effect, but to my knowledge, this is the first time we've seen that. Uh, getting as low as 7% or as low as even 4% oil saturation after polymer flood is really unheard of. Uh, the poor scale microfluidic and micromodel experiments, as well as the lattice Boltzmann simulations, provide new insights into these exciting observations that we had. And then finally, our simulations in, well, I call it a real pilot, but a synthetic pilot test showed that the viscoelastic polymer can recover incremental recovery over inelastic polymers at the field scale. So with that, I'd like to thank the many students and postdocs who, who've done this work over the last decade or so. Um, they've really done um, outstanding work and, and, uh, and really made some fantastic observations. Also, um, several of my colleagues that I've, I've worked with that, that have helped me um, to get to some of these conclusions. And of course, our, our funding support, especially the chemical EOR industrial affiliate program and uh, our recent collaboration with King Fod University of Petroleum um, that made it possible. And um, again, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors in the EOR IAP. We do have our annual review meeting coming up just in a, in a couple of weeks for our sponsors. So very much looking forward to that. Um, so with that, uh, be happy to take any questions you might have. Are there any practical limitations to the potential field scale implementation of the techniques you present? Um, so that, that's an excellent uh, question, um, one that I get a lot. And um, I, I, I think I have to answer that absolutely, yes, there are limitations. Um, and the biggest limitation is that we need a significant Debra number to make a difference. Um, so the polymer has to be viscoelastic, and that's going to likely require uh, higher polymer concentrations, a relatively low salinity, and many times we, we, we can't control the salinity. Um, and, you know, we're using a relatively high molecular weight polymer, and if the permeability is re relatively low, then that's difficult to do. Uh, so all those things contribute to the relaxation time of the Debra number. I would say that um, even if your Debra number, even if your relaxation time is relatively small, maybe near the wells, you would get good recovery, but um, far away, then the Debra number might be small enough, um, which is why I've long advocated, I'm, I'm not a chemist, but um, I've long advocated in, as to developing new, uh, new polymers, grafting new polymers, right? We do that all the time. So many of our sponsors are working on those types of things to, to um, alter HPAM so that it has optimal rheological properties. And, and so then there's a follow-up question to that, which was salinity was too low in the majority of your test. Um, it, it was very low, right? So, um, you know, with the, my approach to uh, experiments and, and, and trying to, to do science is, is oftentimes to, you know, let's Let's look at the extremes and see if there if there's something there. We knew that a low salinity would increase the relaxation time and increase the Debra number, and we wanted to see if there was really an effect there. Um, it is true that that those low salinities might be very challenging or impossible in, in fields, but the fact that we've shown that if we can increase the relaxation time, whether it be from salinity or something else, then there could be an effect. So again, that's why I advocate for. Uh, helping to develop new polymers that maybe don't require that low salinity to get a high relaxation time. What would be the impact of wettability on the mechanism of reducing SOR with viscoelastic polymers? Uh, so 
Another great question that we haven't answered entirely yet. Um, I did allude to the fact that we did two or three uh, core flood experiments that were oil wet. So what we did is I think we took a Bentheimer core but aged it um, to change the wettability. Uh, that was work done by Julia Jin and it's in, in her um, thesis and papers. What we saw is what appeared to be an effect. It was a little less conclusive, so it's hard to say for sure. Uh, some of the mechanisms that, I, that we demonstrated with our microfluidics and lattice Boltzmann may have only been in water wet media. So I think there still needs to be work done in, in the area of wettability. Uh, we do see what we appear to be an effect, but I, I don't want to come to too conclusive of a um, final statement on that. You know, again, the question is, how can Deborah number be increased? So Deborah number, uh, what we showed was the dimensionless number that, that had the greatest effect on this residual oil saturation. It is proportional to both the velocity and the relaxation time. So double the velocity, double the, the Deborah number. That's not something that we can always do in the field, right? So um, we're, we're, we're limited by the permeability and what our our pressure gradients can be. Uh, but relaxation time is something that we can control. And, and it is a function of the molecular structure, the molecular weight, the concentration, the salinity. And some of those things are, the, are, are things we can control. Um, and and I'll, I, I know I sound like, a, um, like I'm repeating myself, but, um, but that's why I think that there's, uh, reasons to, to graph new polymers and, and develop new polymers that have that optimal relaxation time because it, it most definitely is a function of the molecular structure. How does the relationship between SOR and Deborah number change with meta wettability? Um, so uh, again, to follow up what I said before, we, we just don't have enough data at this time to, to do that. So that, that's something I would be very interested in learning more about. And I think a lot of these questions are similar. So, so here's another one. How do you think the effect of polymer flood on carbonate rocks? Um, and for fractured um, reservoirs. So um, if the question's about polymer flooding um, in, in general, then, you know, they're very promising. And we do do lots of polymer floods in, in, in carbonate rocks, um, which tend to be oil wet or, or mixed wet. Um, there's another part of that question is about um, fracture media and um, they can be excellent for conformance control, right? So carbonates are historically, you know, very heterogeneous and you have a lot of fractures and, and the polymers could contribute to that. As far as the elastic effect, uh, again, we're still not sure yet. And even the oil wet media that we did experiments on, those were in Bentheimer, which are naturally water wet, but we we change the wettability. Um, and the reason why we did that is it's really hard to do comparisons with carbonate rocks. So if I did two experiments and I showed one recovered more oil than the other, it'd be hard to determine the reason because the heterogeneity of those two, the pore structure of those two cores would probably be very, very different. Another really good question is, um, how do you make sure the benefit is not due to low salinity? So uh, there, we all know that there is a, a low salinity effect, and this has been seen over and over again, both in the field and experiments, that if you lower the salinity, then that changes, um, it, that improves recovery. And there's lots of different theories as to why that works. So to um, answer your question, I would say two things. Um, the first is that even though the salinity was low, it wasn't any lower than the water flood and the brine and the and the pot and the glycerin flood that preceded it, right? So if there was a low salinity effect, then the the initial floods would have already um, accomplished that, um, right? Um, the other thing is, is that we did do experiments where the salinity wasn't particularly high, but we increased the relaxation time in other ways and we got similar results. So it seemed like if, if we got a high Deborah number, regardless of how we got there, whether it be low salinity or higher molecular weight or higher velocity, that um, we would get similar results. Mojda has a great question here about said polymers are often degraded before flowing in deeper formations. 
what is the impact of degraded polymers on Debra number and SOR reduction? So uh, the degrading the polymer um, will reduce its molecular weight and it will almost certainly reduce its relaxation time and, um, and therefore the Debra number. So that would be another uh, practical limitation, something that we'd have to take into effect, right? So um, um, mechanical degradation is, is often intentionally done for, for low permeability reservoirs. So uh, there's a question about, um, you know, comment on the effect of viscoelasticity on a heavy oil the viscosity greater than a thousand centipoise, um, like those in Pelican Lake. Um, they are, um, so we did do heavy oils, um, but I would say we didn't go above about 150 centipoise. So I don't have any data for a thousand centipoise. I would say that, uh, I wouldn't expect anything different. Um, it, don't see a reason, um, to see a different, of course, with those very heavy oils, the, the big advantage of polymers is mobility control. And it would be very hard in the laboratory to be certain that we saw something there, because if you did that first water flood with a thousand centipoise, it would take forever to get to residual oil saturation. Um, so um, I, I don't have enough data to say for sure, but um, I see no reason why there wouldn't be an effect, an viscoelastic effect there for very uh, high viscosity oils. Um, have you tried cores initiated at SORW using a centrifuge before, in, before applying viscoelastic polymer? Uh, we, we have not, to my knowledge, but um, that was a, uh, that's a really good idea. Maybe something that we should try um, in the future. The next question is, would increasing the viscosity to increase the capillary number rather than uh, decreasing the surface tension impact injectivity? So uh, I'll answer that a few different ways. So absolutely, you know, so, th so that's our, our big concern with polymer flooding is that uh, when we inject uh, polymers, the high viscosity affects injectivity. And, and, and sometimes that's the biggest deterrent for doing poor polymer floods in, in reservoirs. Now we're doing some work right now with uh, Dr. Espinosa and our graduate student Zihao Li to better understand injectivity. Um, and, um, and what we're seeing and what, what's observed sometimes in the field is that injectivity tends to be better, um, than, than expected sometimes. Um, but, um, absolutely increasing the viscosity is going to, um, make injectivity, uh, more challenging, which is, you know, the, the major concern with polymer fluids. Uh, were the cores hundred percent oil saturated? If so, do you expect different results if you start with water at SWI and oil? So in almost every one of our experiments, we did not start at 100% oil saturation. So we would initially saturate with brine and then inject oil. And then our initial condition was about 80, 85% oil saturation. There was at least one exception. When we tried to do the oil wet core, um, what we found is, is that the initial oil saturation, it, it was, uh, I'm trying to remember the details, but, but it was hard to really come to much conclusion when we started out with an initial water saturation. So we did do one or two experiments in the oil wet cores where we started out with 100% oil saturation, um, because that was the only way that we could, um, really be able to do a quantitative comparison. But in, in 95, 99% of the experiments, we always started out with an initial water saturation. Thank you all for attending. And, um, and I think that uh, if you're interested, that a link will be provided for a, a very short video on our uh, chemical EOR industrial affiliate program, um, if, you're, if you're interested in that. The Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment, or CSEE, is an organized research unit at the University of Texas at Austin that specializes in all aspects of subsurface energy uh, and the in minimizing the environmental impact um, that it has.
One of the ways we work with industry is these industrial affiliates programs. One of the IAPs is, is the Chemical Enhanced Oil Recovery IAP, which is designed to, to work on chemical flooding met methods for an enhancing oil recovery in reservoirs. We work on improving the oil recovery in um, harsh reservoirs such as high temperature, high salinity carbonate reservoirs, fracture reservoirs, viscous oil reservoirs, and many others. In the recent years, we have come up with new uh, carboxylate type of surfactants that are compatible with high salinity. We have come up with surfactants that can change the wettability in carbonate reservoirs. And we have improved the foam stability by including nanoparticles along with surfactants. We've been developing and testing new polymers, synthetic polymers um, that are useful at high temperature, high salinity reservoirs. We are doing things like adding um, bio size to improve the stability. We're testing new polymers that uh, are effective in low permeability reservoirs, including below 10 millidarcies, uh, which really expands the use of what we can do with polymers. We do the experimental research to identify the basic physics that's happening uh, at, at the small scale, at the lab scale. But then to apply this research at the reservoir scale, which is much bigger, thousand times bigger, we need to take this physics and apply it at that scale. So that's why you have to develop theoretical models and put those models in computational models or reservoir simulations to see whether it is effective at the reservoir scale. We use uh, UTCHEM. Um, it's a reservoir simulator. It's the world's leading chemical flooding simulator. What's very unique about it is the, the research that we do here at UT Austin and, and, in, and in the IAP are inputs into the model. So as, as we have new discoveries, as we develop new models from those experiments, we input them into UT Chem, we test them, we validate them against other experiments and field data. And uh, what we've seen that industry will use UT Chem uh, to benchmark their simulators. Then they'll use the new science and the new models that are input into UT Chem to eventually add to their own simulators down the line. Our industrial partners have a very big role in shaping the research that we do. As we all know, the oil industry is, has big ups and downs, more than, far more than most. That makes it very difficult for the industry to sustain long-term research on enhanced oil recovery. First, they, of course, give us feedback. They suggest things that are important to them, that matter to them. They have problems that they've struggled with, longer-term problems, of course, and more fundamental problems that they want us to, to tackle. We continue to do the research with our graduate students year in and year out, decade in, decade out. So that, that is one of our biggest uh, benefits to the industry is this continuity.